<laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about Tisha B'Av. We're going to be concluding what we were talking about about this entire period of Ben Hametzarim. Okay, so Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. We're going to be talking about the date itself, as Maharal talks about it, the events that took place, what this has to do with us, how this concludes this period of the three weeks, and what should we do with it in the future. So let's start with the idea of it being the nine. Okay, when Hashem created the world, he did so using making 10 statements, let there be this, let there be that, 10 times. Maral points out 10 is a unit, right? Here's why we count 10. But after you finish and there are no more fingers, you start again. Okay, so 10 is whole, 10 is a unit. Okay, so after 10, you start something new. So if you're talking about a number that connotates as far as you could have fragmentation before it forms a whole, that number is nine. Okay, it's not 10, it didn't reach a whole. But if it would be 11, it would already be the beginning of something new. So nine is the symbol of fragmentation and lack of wholeness. Okay, and nine, the baby is born after nine months, ideally. <coughs> so the ninth of Av. So nothing is coincidental, Maharal maintains. He says if something is true, it's going to be true on all levels. It's going to be true aesthetically and philosophically and numerically, scientifically, spiritually. Truth, by definition, is the whole picture. That's what truth is. So when somebody says, well, that's a partial truth, it's not the truth. There's no such thing as a partial truth. Accuracy is not the same thing as truth. Accuracy is describing something as it is, but it may not be the whole picture. In fact, accuracy could be very far from truth. If somebody were to ask you, who is Hitler, and you answer a vegetarian, that's accurate, but it's not true. Okay, so 10 is a whole and nine is a fragment. So the events that took place on, on Tisha B'Av are the ones that focus us more than any other events on seeing the world as a place of fragmentation and not seeing Hashem's underlying unity. So I want to tell you what that's like. I may have told you this awful story, it's a true story, because it's very much on my heart. So they did um, a lockdown in, here in, in Israel around um, a month ago, a little bit more, and it was very, more, it was more than a month ago, two months ago. It was very effective. It brought down the, the COVID, to a double-digit figure, but it was an economic disaster. So they interviewed storekeepers, and the storekeepers were saying, I don't know what's going to be. I can't keep my store open without customers. The customers aren't allowed to come. Okay, so one of the men who was um, hit hard was a man who's a vendor in the Machana Yehuda open market. The open market was like a ghost town during the, the lockdown. So he was worried and said, what am I going to do? Now, as they reduced the severity of the lockdown, they permitted stores to open. If the stores opened up to a public street and there was lots of air, that's not Machana Yehuda. So when he found out the new law allowing stores that face the pavement to open up, he killed himself. The man killed himself. Now, that's because he saw that and to him, the world came to an end. He has no way to support himself and his family. The government policies to his mind are unfair. Okay. Now think about today. Rightly or wrongly, the businesses are all open. If if he were alive today, he would be in Machar Yehuda and his store would be open and everything would be different. Why am I telling you this terrible story? To him, there was no overriding unity. There was no divine plan. There was no, this will lead to something else. I don't blame him. I didn't live his life. I didn't have his education. But 
That's what it was for him. So anyone who commits suicide, and if you know people who committed suicide, anyone, either passively or actively, who wishes to end their life, on some level is living in with fragmentation and doesn't see the overwhelming and overriding unity with Hashem's compassion. So this is Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is a celebration, I use the word celebration advisedly, of a day in which we saw disorder, in which we saw chaos, in which we did not see the overwhelming unity. So let's talk with that in mind about things that actually occurred on Tisha B'Av. So the earliest thing that occurred was that spies had come to Moshe while the Jews were in the desert. They were about to enter Israel. And the spies said, we have to know more about the land. We can't just enter. Where's, where's north? Where's south? Where's the water? Where are the bridges? Like, so Moshe said, okay, you want to see the land? I'll show you the land. He didn't want to appear to be like a, somebody who says, uh, you, have to take, you have to take it in the bag. No, I'll open it. Look. And he told them, look, see the city, see the people, see the fruit, see everything. Okay. But he knew that something might go wrong. How do we know he knew something might go wrong? One of the men who he sent was his student, his prize student. At the time, it was called Hoshea. And he changed his name to Yehoshua. He added a Yud, the first of the letters in Hashem's name, to make him aware that Hashem is there and that there's always an overriding plan. Okay. The other person who didn't fall into the trap was a man called Kale, who on his own, with that help from Moshe, stayed loyal. They returned. The people said, what's it like? Now here's the part that's important for our purposes. Remember, we're talking about Tisha B'Av in our lives. They didn't lie. It's important for you to know this. They didn't lie. They didn't say anything that wasn't completely true. The cities are fortified. The people are strong. It's all true. We will never be able to conquer this land even that was true if the we just meant us humans. Who was left out? Hashem. So what should they have said? Almost everything they did said is what they should have said. They should have said, land is vast, it's unconquerable. The people are strong, they have watchtowers. If it wasn't for God, we would never be able to conquer it. That's what they should have said. So their sin, and it was a severe sin, was being in a position of power and influence and taking God out of the picture. And the people bought it. They spent the whole night crying. The night of Tisha B'Av in the desert was spent crying. And it gets worse. You see, how could it get worse? They put it into words. What words did they use? Besinat Hashem Otanu. Otsianami Evitz Betrayim. Hashem took us out of Egypt because he hates us, because he knew we would fail, and now we'll bear the burden of our failure. Okay, so now forget about Tishabov. Picture a situation in the lives of somebody you know, or somebody you've heard of, or something historical. I want you to picture a situation where a person could feel, I did something wrong, God hates me, I may as well give up. Could you picture a situation like that? Okay, so I'm going to tell you one from the Torah. Here you have Yosef. He didn't choose his life. Remember that. He didn't choose to be the favorite son. He didn't choose to be attractive. He didn't choose to be charismatic. He didn't choose to have dreams. He didn't choose to be sold. Okay? He is sold. He's a, he's a slave. He didn't even understand the language. You know, today, oftentimes, you, oftentimes, thank God, not often, but every so often, you hear about soldiers being captured and being released. Everybody in Israel understands some Arabic. 
Okay, Yosef hid Egypt. He didn't understand their language. He's 17. He's away from home. He was betrayed by his family. His master's wife tries to seduce him. And the Midrash would go with God. She would change her clothes several times a day, like in the movies, and um, be very inviting, very seductive. And came the day. It's a religious festival. Everybody went to their temple. She made an excuse. Oh, I have a headache. Okay. She's in the house. He's downstairs in the, the lower floors doing accounting. She comes to him. She wants him. She threatens him. I'm going to tell people that you were with me whether you were with me or not. Okay. Now here's the part of the story that you may not know because you heard the story originally when you were children and they kind of censor things a little bit. It reached a point because of her seductions. He wanted her also. He's only, he was only a human being. He was only a human being. He's alone. She wants him. She's trying her best with every feminine wile. And the Talmud tells us that his desires were aroused and the physical realities that occur to a man when his desires are aroused happened. And I want you to hear what he was thinking. Be him. I wanted another man's wife. Now we all know the last of the Ten Commandments is don't desire, don't covet what belongs to another person. Not his wife, not his, okay. I wanted another man's wife. I'm doomed. I'm going to go to hell. I may as well take her. That's what was going on in his head. Could you picture this? Okay, what happened next? He forced himself to see his father, Yaakov, the great tzaddik. He brought Yaakov's image to his mind. And he asked himself, do I, who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And he said, I want to be like that. And he was able to resist her, which led to the whole rest of the story. Why am I telling you this? At that moment, the moment of his great challenge and failure, I want to make, it, I want to make this clear, his supposition was true. He did want another man's wife. He did have to pay for this. There was a price. But to say Hashem hates you and to say there's no resolution, that's a whole different story. So the Jews on Tisha B'Av said, Hashem brought us here because he hates us. The definition of hate is distance. If love is close as hate is distance. He doesn't care about our fate. We're finished. So God's response was very strange. The two responses. One is you don't want to go into the land. You're afraid to go into the land. You will not go into the land. You'll be here in the desert till 40 years elapse. A year for every day. The spy mission was 40 days. You're going to be in the desert 40 years. So I want to ask you a funny question. Was that good for the Jews or bad for the Jews to be in the desert for 40 years under those circumstances? Okay. What do you think, Deborah? Was it good for them or bad for them? The God said, all right, you're stuck. You're going to be in the desert 40 years. Uh, if I was them at that time, I'd say it's bad. And from where you see I things wouldn't want to today? Uh, I, it was bad at that time, yeah. Bad. Especially if I was there, I was there. Right, if you were them, you'd for sure see it was bad. Hell yeah. If you were them, would you see it's bad? And if you were yourself where you are today, would you see it as bad? Is your name Talia? That is the question, okay. Maybe not. Let's see who else. Who else's name is here? Deborah. Are you there? Is there Deborah? Is that, is that is me? Another, or is there another one? one? Okay. <laughs> okay. So would you say that it was reasonable for them to say, if God is making us stay in the desert for forty years, that's because He hates us, or because He loves us, or what? What is it? What does it reflect of us? 
I suppose when you're going through hard times, sometimes you think that you're not loved and you're hated and you're being punished. But obviously in hindsight, we, all, we know the story so we can look back and we can see ah, that exactly. challenges were for a reason. And everything that we go through at the moment in life is for a reason. It, when you're going through it, it's hard and you, you think, why me, why me? Or you try not to think, why me, why me? Um, but at the end of the day, we know it's, it's only for our ultimate best because we're here to become closer to Hashem. So it's all got to be good. You've got it. You've absolutely got it. And I see people going, yay, okay, yay for her. Okay, you got, you got it right. Meaning, where they were standing, there's no way they would see the benefit of it. From We know the end of the story, so we could see the benefit of it. It was a time of tikkun. It was a time where they saw things they needed to see. It was a time of laying foundations. It was also a very painful and difficult time because they didn't get what they want. So I want to talk to you about getting what you want. Okay, there's a basic rule. Physically and materially, you may or may not get what you want because God will give you what you need in order to do your mission in life. A person's mission may not be the mission they would like because we only see the middle of the story. Remember that. <coughs> but materially and physically, you have what you need for your mission. Spiritually, you can have whatever you want. There are no, there's no ceiling. Spiritually, and this is Rambam talking, not me, I'm quoting Rambam. Any person could be a tzaddik as great as Moshe. You could be a tzaddik as great as Moshe, or you could sink as low as Yeravam ben Nevat. Who is Yeravam ben Nevat? The one who split the kingdom and turned the, the majority of tribes into idolatrous worshippers by creating an alternative idolatrous temple. So you're thinking, I can't do that. I have a little tiny life. I don't have a big life like Moshe. I'm not going to like lead the Jews out of Egypt, which today would be get all the Jews to do tshuva. Me, I'm happy if I could separate the white and the colored. Okay. And even there, but I have a white shirt and it has like black trimming. I get a little confused. Okay. So I don't live a big life, you could think. So I want to tell you something. Whether you're righteous or wicked is not concerned. It isn't determined by whether you live a big life or a small life. What do you think determines whether you're considered a tzaddik or a rasha, a righteous person or an evil person? It's whether you do your mission or not. Your mission, I don't want to shock you, isn't Moshe's mission, mission. It's your mission. Anybody could be a tzaddik and do their mission as faithfully and as well as Moshe did his. And you could think, I'm a small person, there's a limit to how much damage I could do. I could break up my family maybe, but that's about as far as I can go. I'm not, I don't have my finger on the nuclear button, the one that says do not touch, okay? So you may not be living a big life, but you could be living a full life and it could be full of the bad stuff. Okay, so it says, God said, you wept for nothing. This will be a day in which you weep forever. Let's talk about weeping, about crying. Is crying good or bad? What do you think? You're English, I know what you think. <laughs> Keep a stiff of a lift. It's good. Some, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's therapeutic. <laughs> so it says when your heart it is full, joy. It overflows. Crying is good for you if but there's a condition. There's a That's difference the between grief, mourning, and, and complaining. Let's talk about these three words. Okay, mourning. What's mourning all about? Mourning. Someone suffers a bereavement. There should be mourning. What's the mourning about? What's it for? And what's it about? It's partly respect, isn't it? Partly respect for the nifter. 
Okay, mourning is about saying, I miss this person or this thing. Something is missing. Isn't it comforting? Mourning could be comforting. But the idea is to acknowledge that something is missing. If you can't mourn, what you're basically doing is devaluing the imprint of the life of the person who you should be mourning. Does this make sense to you? Okay. So mourning isn't about the person who died. Hashem has mercy. He judges people in a way in which if we were judging, there would be far less mercy, which doesn't mean he forgets things. He doesn't forget anything, but there's mercy. So death isn't a tragedy for the nifter, but for the people who miss him, it is harsh. So because of this, there's mourning. Is that the same as complaining? No. Okay, grief is different than, than complaining. How is grief different than complaining? A reason. You have, a, you have real pain. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual fact. It's, it's, actual not, a cho- fact. it's not a choice. And you're, no you're choice. Being, grieving the past where perhaps you're complaining about what you want for the future and you're deciding your future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you're also grieving something you've lost. I think that's also... You've got it. Grief has to do, and it's an ideal sense, something that's genuinely lost. So something that's lost. So the preciousness of the object has to do with mourning, but the fact that it's lost has to do with grief. Complaining has to do with saying it's not the way I think it should be. I want it to be whose way? My way. Sometimes there's a place for that but it's not a substitute for grieving or mourning. (coughs) The Jews had to grieve and mourn their lost opportunity to be in Eretz Yisrael. So even though they needed the tikkun of being in the desert, they lost the the possibility of being in Eretz Yisrael in their lifetimes. Okay, let's move it further. The next event we're going to talk about is the destruction of the two Batei Mikdash. So in our previous classes, we spoke a bit about the Beis HaMikdash. I want to review this. It says in the Torah, make me a sanctuary and I'll live in you. It doesn't say I'll live in it, I'll live in you. What does the sanctuary look like? So before we describe the outside, which was different in the Beis HaMikdash than it was in the sanctuary in the desert, we'll describe the inside, which was very similar. So the directionality was going from east to west. So you, that's how you enter. You're entering from the east, going west. You see a, a series of courtyards. They end up by the Ulam and the Hechal, and you're still heading west. You're going to the Holy of Holies. So the first thing, it says, make me a sanctuary, I'll live in you. What was in the Holy of Holies? What was in the Kodesh Kodeshim? The Aram. The Ark. What was in the Ark? The Tablets of the Law. Okay, so the first thing, you want a sanctuary, I want to live in you. Your mind should be the Aaron. If you want it, if you want that level of kirva to Hashem, if you don't want this loss, if you don't want the other, you want to be full and complete, your mind should be the Aaron. And in fact, there are three um, skull-like coverings over the brain. Okay, they all end with the word dura. I don't remember them accurately. Metadura and two others, okay? Just like there were three arrow notes, the bottom one of gold, then wood, then gold. Okay, your mind is covered, but it begins with purity, with gold. And there should be growth, wood, and then return to purity. That's what your mind should be. Your mind is you. Samara explains being redeemed means being able to be yourself. We just said loss and grief is when you don't have something. The way we think today is not our truest self as a people. We think other people's thoughts. 
we buy into other people's dreams. It says in Shir Hashirim that you took me to guard your vineyards, but I didn't guard my own vineyard. No matter where we've lived in the last 2,000 years, we have been the guardian of other people's vineyards. We succeed. We succeed professionally. We succeed economically. We succeed politically. But in the end, it's somebody else's vineyard. Your mind should be devoted to what? To your vineyard. So again, if you want to experience the Geula of being in the Beis HaMikdash, rather than mourning for it not being there, the first step is making a commitment to learn. Your mind has to have the Torah in it. The Torah is the GPS. It's the, it's the map. Okay. So everyone should learn something every day. My recommendation would be something having to do with Jewish law, and something having to do with ethical teachings, such as Pirkei Avos. Okay, you have to learn. So again, that was the extreme west. We're coming out. There's a curtain separating the Aron from the rest. This curtain is called the Prochet. This is to tell you that your mind in the end is private. Nobody knows your mind. No one knows your inner life. So you're into another large room. On one hand, there's the sacred table, and on the other side, there's the menorah. What's the table? Again, Hashem says, make me a sanctuary, I'll live in you, and then we have a design for having purity of thought and mind. What's the table telling you? In Judaism, food is very important. Have you noticed this? Okay, people say virtually every holiday could be described. Things were hard. God save us. Let's eat. Okay. Okay, so um, what's this about? God made the necessity to eat. If food didn't taste good, we would still have to eat. We would experience hunger. But he gave us the ability to taste food, which is a gift. One of the symptoms of corona is not being able to taste. There have even been people who lost their ability to taste afterwards as well. Okay, the ability to taste is a great chesed from Hashem. Could you see where this is so? Now, here it is. Think of your favorite food. I know this is a hard assignment. I know that not everybody could do it. Some are more gifted, some are left. Ilana Frieden, what's your favorite food? Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate, okay. Um, Haley, what's your favorite food? Kala or chips? Kala or chips? Okay, one more. Rhonda, what's your favorite? It's all the same to you. Okay. Okay, so you're all there with your favorite food? Okay, so experiencing your favorite food. Ah, oh, she says chocolate, chocolate, okay. English people like chocolate, I see. Americans would say pizza, okay. South Africans would say meat. Meat, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, uh, okay, marshmallows, hmm, okay. So, so with that in mind, Okay, Hashem made you hungry and he made food taste good. This could act as a bridge or a wall. How could it be a wall? I know that this couldn't happen to you because you're, pe you're people of great self-control and dignity. And you're English. Okay, but here it is. Somehow all of the chocolate bars are gone. Fairies must have taken them in the middle of the night. There were several at the beginning of the week. Week? Okay, whatever. Week, W-E-A-K. Okay. Okay. They're gone somehow. So you're so involved in its taste and its smell that you forget everything else. Could that happen? It can. And then it blocks you because all you're seeing is the physical experience. 
but the food itself could be a bridge between you and God. How? You have the chocolate there, and you think, just for a minute, God made, me, made this delicious capacity. He's the one who made cocoa beans grow. He's the one who made vanilla beans grow. He's the one who made all of these unhealthy oils and, okay, whatever, <laughs> okay. And they all taste good. And I'm going to say to him, God, you're the source of all blessings. You're the ruler. No one else could have brought this about. Everything was made through your word. Shakol Nyebidvaro. Now at that point, are you connected or disconnected? You're connected. So the idea is the table could be sacred could be sacred. Across from, now the table was on the north side. The north side gets the least sun. It's the place of least enlightenment. The hardest place to bring God is the material world which means the accomplishment of bringing him to the material world is very, very great. Right across on the south side, the side of light, you have the menorah. It was the menorah to see that, that the Beis Hamikdash was light and pe the Gohan didn't go tripping over each other? No. What was its purpose? Its purpose was to demonstrate to us what Hashem's light is. Remember, Make me a sanctuary and I'll live where? In who? In you. There are seven branches. They, they parallel the seven emotive attributes that we share in common with Hashem. Our desire to be kind and contributive. Our ability to overcome obstacles. Our ability to see the beauty of truth. Our ability to prevail and to see that there's something bigger than today, to head towards Olam Haba. Our ability to be grateful. Our ability to say, and it's all from him, and I'll use it towards him. Okay, so those are the seven branches. Now, here's the part that's relevant, though, to you. The branches don't light themselves. If you want spiritual light, you have to light the oil. It doesn't happen by itself. It has to be ignited. So you have to be able to say, if I want to experience my own soul, my own spirituality, I have to do something. Okay, next. Between these two, the table and the menorah, in the middle and further out, further east, was the incense altar. So again, this is all about make me a sanctuary and I live in you. So we know how to live, bring Hashem our minds, our bodies, our souls. What's this incense offering about? So the word for incense in Hebrew is ketoret. The tet and shin in classical Hebrew sometimes interchange. So the literal meaning of the word ketoret is kesharet, kosheret, bonded or bind. What's this about? Okay, so there were 11 different ingredients in the Ketoret. 10 of them were fragrant, one of them was awful. So it's all about the sense of smell. So when you go back to the Garden of Eden, which I'm sure you go to frequently, wait a minute, this is a survey I'm doing in my head. Is there a dairy restaurant in London called the Garden of Eden? It's not like Borough Park. It's not like Flatbush. It's not like Crown Heights. It's not like Chicago. It's not like Atlanta. Look what you're missing. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so the Garden of Eden, which in Flatbush is truly terrible. Okay. <laughs> so the Garden of Eden was the place in which the snake was there to offer temptation. Is temptation good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? What do you think? Rachel, is it good or bad? Temptation is good for us or bad for us? What do you think? Uh, depends how you react to it. Ah, you've got it. Of course it's good for us because it offers the possibility of reaction. Of course it's good for us. You should welcome challenge ideally, but don't ever ask for it. Okay? 
So the basic rule in Gan Eden is it's all good, it's all tempting, it's all possible. And God said, don't eat from one of the trees. That's your, that's your job. Don't do this. The tree was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, meaning you could integrate it and make it your own. Okay, now the snake enters the picture. Do you know the word for snake in Hebrew? This is going to have to do with Tisha B'Av. I see the doubt rising in your, in your mind. How do you say snake in Hebrew? Nachash. Nachash. Turn it into a verb. Le, le nachesh. Does any of you know what that means? It means to guess. Okay. Doubt. The nachesh was a source of doubt. And again, challenge is good for us. So he says to Chava, touch it, eat it, see it. Okay. What doesn't he say? Smell it. The sense of smell is more ethereal than the other senses. So Hashem breathes into Adam's nostrils the soul of life. The katarit was a korban for smell. Take all of the parts of you that are spiritual and offer it to Hashem, because now I'm going to get to the part that's complex for our lives. You could have the best intentions and do the worst things with them. Is that true? Okay, think about what's happening in America, the demonstrations which are violent and horrific because of the death of the black man by an American police officer, right? How many people were killed so far, do you know? I don't either, I lost count with 15. Okay, were stores robbed? Were stores robbed, were they? Were cars destroyed? Yes. Were houses burnt down? Yes. Okay. A percentage of the people who were doing all of this terrible stuff were people who were sure they were morally in the high ground. They're changing the rules of the game. They're destroying the structure of an unfair society. This is what they think. So you know what that means? Are you ready? They experienced the snake that made them doubt. And now even their chesed is corrupted. Chesed could be corrupted. Gvura could be corrupted. Your sense of overcoming difficulties is only valid if the difficulties you're overcoming are worth overcoming. Do you ever look at the Guinness Book of Records? Yes, no? No? Okay. How many teenagers could fit in a car trunk if you really try? What number do you think? Throw a number. Joanne, you know? Six. Um, four, uh, four. Six. Something like six. I don't remember. And they couldn't... <laughs> okay, so why am I telling you this? They feel like they achieved something. Is that an achievement? No. But the desire to achieve is holy. So the desire to achieve was captured by the forces of superficiality and nonsense. Sometimes the desire to do chesed is captured by ego. Have you ever seen that one? Sometimes love of truth is corrupted by sadism. I had to tell her that she gave like whatever. And it goes that way for everything. The effect of the korban that's called katar that uses the sense of smell is to recapture the things that were stolen. Okay, so again, all of this has to do with what? Make me a sanctuary and I'll live in you. So there was first the sanctuary in the desert and then the base of Mikdash in Yerushalayim. And then what happened? Then what happened? was destroyed. Its destruction, is this about the Babylonians? Is that what it's about? It's about us. It's about God. God, so to speak, and I'll explain to you what this Chazal means soon. Chazal let out his wrath on stones and on wood and not on his people. 
So what's Hashem's wrath? For us, anger is a little voice inside of us. This isn't how it should be. It should be the way I want it to be. Everything should be the way I want it to be, especially this. Now, sometimes I, um, anger could be justified. Are there things that happen in the world that are not as they should be? Well, this is so English. If you were from California and America, they'd all be, they'd be demonstrating by now. Okay. Give me an example of something. Depends how you like define. What? It depends how you define what should be. But That's right. Should. Absolutely. Right. There's things that happen that, should, that are not right. as they That's should exactly be. Exactly what I wanted you to say. Perfect. So I'm going to give you some, you're good. Okay, I'm going to give you some possibilities. Okay, so everybody dreads having nothing to live for. Is that true? Is that true? Yes. So here are the options. You could live for pleasure. Are there people who live for pleasure? Yes. And this could include food, dance, music, um, nature, some ownership. Okay, clear? And it's real. You live for pleasure, you get pleasure. The problem is it's a little bit superficial and very transient. Did you see where this is so? So to go on to the next level, you don't have to give up wanting pleasure, but you have to recognize it's not the whole story. So a higher level of that than, uh, than pleasure would be enjoying the companionship of your friends and your relatives. Okay, you enjoy being with your friends and relatives? <laughs> you should see your faces. Could you see each other or you could only see me? What's the, how does it go on Zoom? Could you see each other? You can see, if you've opened up on the screen, you can see all the people that have got their screens on. Uh -huh. But there's some people that don't have their screens on or a lot of people yeah. that don't, so we just okay. see their names. So, yeah. Some of the interesting expressions, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you like your friends and neighbors? Yes. Most of them. <laughs> okay, so friends, neighbors, relatives. It gives you pleasure to have connection. It gives everyone pleasure to have connection. But there's still a however. And the however is that things go according to your rules. If they don't go according to your rules, it's very hard. Did you see where this is so? Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, what's the worst thing that somebody could say in marriage? I wish I never met you. Okay, now once those words are said, could they be unsaid? Not really. So if a person hears those words, then it's not, it's not good anymore. So all of the relationship things are good as long as both parties are playing by the rules, which doesn't always happen. That makes sense to you? Okay, so there's a higher level than that. A higher level than that would be looking for ethical meaning, which is also very difficult because people end up backing the wrong causes. The only thing that's going to ever give you real satisfaction in life is being with Hashem moment by moment. So the exactitude of the halacha are very helpful in this regard. The Christians, some of, some of the Christian thinkers also recognize this, they realize Christianity can't offer them that because there are no halachot. Okay, so why am I telling you all of this? The Ketoret, this is what we were talking about. The Ketoret recaptured everything so that your life will have meaning because you're devoted to good, which would mean what, in the light of what I just said, being with God on his terms, moment by moment. Okay, clear? Okay, so that's what we miss. So we miss the fulfillment and the ability to have a sanctuary and have it work. So the Kotzka Rebbe used to say when people would say, gosh, I find it hard to weep for the Beis HaMikdash, he would say, weep for yourself. Weep for yourself, for your mind. Weep for your heart. Weep for your relationships. Weep, weep, weep for your disconnect with God. 
because it's real. So what Tisha B'Av is, is about is embracing that reality. We have failed and we're still here. We suffer terribly, but God has given us life and endurance. I don't understand why it has to be that way. Yeshe Kayach, neither does anybody else. Understanding isn't part of the game. Okay, so the name of the game is Emuna. What does Emuna mean? It means relating everything back to God. There's a creator, the creator is good, meaning he creates things in ways that are good. And, and this is the big end. He created good, he created bad, and he gave me the ability to make choices. Tisha B'Av is the celebration of having made all the wrong choices. It's failure day. Okay, so you're all familiar with the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa? You know the story I'm talking about? Yeah. Anyone who doesn't know the story? Maybe just uh, tell it. Okay, really, really short. There's a man, let's call him the host. The host is making a party. Party! Okay, he has a servant. He sends the servant to invite his friend Kamsa. The servant makes a mistake. Okay, and he puts the invitation in the box of a man called Bar Kamsa. Maybe it was Kamsa's son, maybe not, because Bar means son. Maybe it was just a name. Okay, Bar Kamsa gets the invitation. He goes to the party. The host, for reasons that you'll understand soon, didn't want him at the party. So he said, please leave. And he didn't want to leave. He wanted people to see him leaving. After the host spoke to him in, in a whisper, they'll know that the host asked them to leave. He said, no, I'm not transgressing anything by staying, no. Okay, the host upped the ante. I'll, you know, uh, 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 just go. And Barkanta says, I'll pay for half the suda of all these guests. And the host, again, we'll see later, Bar Kamsa was not a nice man, said, no. He said, I'll pay for the whole suda. And the host still said, no. He got up, he left, he had no choice. He was furious because nobody protested his humiliation. What did he do? This is the part of the story I want you to hear. What did he do? He went to the Roman authorities he said, the Jews are fermenting a rebellion against you. And the Roman, the Roman governor said, how do I know you're telling the truth? So I'll show you. You could bring an offering to the temple and they're not going to accept it. I said, okay. There were those times the non-Jews also brought offerings because they also wanted to elevate their animal selves and they also wanted lives with meaning and they were in the game. So he chooses an animal. And Bar Kamsa arranges for somebody to do a minor injury on the animal, to make a split either in its eye or its lip. Its eye, again, we're talking about the animal's soul being offered. You can't offer an, an animal with a split eye. It means if you can't see straight, you can't elevate yourself. Or your lips, if you can't control your speech, you can't elevate yourself. So those injuries were not considered injuries by the Roman culture, but they were by the Jews. So the animal now was in the temple. And the presiding Kohen saw the, saw the injuries. And he didn't know what to do. Should he offer an invalid animal because he's afraid of the Romans or not? He didn't. He was afraid. The Romans said, ah, you didn't offer my animal. He said, the Jews are in rebellion. And that began the siege. Now, let's think about Bar Kamsa. He's somebody who you would want at your party. Somebody will go to a Roman governor and bring about the destruction of the entire nation. I wouldn't want him at my party. And I'm pretty open. Look, I invite you whenever you come to whatever. <laughs> okay. So he was an evil person. Okay, so the host wasn't so clearly wrong. But there's a question we have to ask about the story. Here are the words of the Talmud. You tell me where the problem lies. And Jerusalem was destroyed 
because of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. Who would you have blamed? How about the host? We don't even know the host's name. They were both equally to blame. They both did wrong. Right, the guest did wrong. So we're taking the host out of the picture. But what about Kamsa? All, the, all he did was not get his invitation. Remember, the servant was sent with an invitation for Kamsa, and he accidentally gave it to Bar Kamsa. We don't even hear about Kamsa. Why should he be blamed for the destruction of Yerushalayim? So I'm going to take you to a level deeper in this story. Nobody was called Kamsa or Bar Kamsa. Those are not names. What does Kamsa mean in modern Hebrew? Yeah? Kamsa nut. What does that mean? Stinginess. Mean, to be mean. Being mean, being stingy. I want to ask you something. Is stinginess or meanness only mm. about money? Is it or not? So Yerushalayim was destroyed because people were stingy. They were kamsa. People wanted to see things in terms of who? Themselves. Now remember we said there were vessels in the base of Mikdash. The Oran, which is the mind. The menorah, which is the heart. The table, which is the body. The katara, which is the soul, right? Could you be stingy with all of those and ungiving? You can. And that's what directly destroyed the Beis HaMikdash. So was it good for the Jews or bad for the Jews that the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed? Is it good for us or bad for us? Think before you answer, it's a complex question. Both answers are wrong, by the way, but tell me why. Defend your answer. Was it good? Is it good or bad? It's good because we weren't destroyed. We weren't destroyed. God took out his wrath on stones and on sticks. It was good. Yeah. Was Auschwitz that. good? <laughs> was the Inquisition <laughs> good? I suppose if you look Perhaps at it from a... terror good? But no every... good. Don't, don't people say everything's for the good? People do, I'm asking you. Well, I wouldn't, on a personal basis, on a human level, no. But in the divine plan of things, everything happens for a reason. Who's smarter? Well, the human eye smarter or the divine eye smarter? Obviously the divine. Okay. So it's a very tricky question because we're not supposed to see it as emotionally acceptable. The whole point of all of the horror is not that we say, well, it's Latova. The whole point of it is to say that it's unacceptable. It's an act of love from God. It's tikkun, but it's not meant to be emotionally acceptable. What is it meant to be? A way of improving and growing from it, becoming better. A way of encountering the worst and most difficult of black places and challenges and say, I believe that I could find Hashem here. That's the tikkun, not only of the sins that led up to the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, but for their father and grandfather, the sin of the spies in the desert who said Hashem acted out of hatred. The tikkun here is to be willing to be challenged, not wanting to be challenged, but willing to be challenged. In what areas? Go back to the desert and then back to the temple. What are the areas where the challenges live? In loving Hashem and loving each other. So Tisha B'Av is a time where everything went wrong, and none of this is meant to be emotionally acceptable. But the core, the core is something that we know about. So there should be mourning, because as we said, if you can't mourn in the face of bereavement, what does that mean? You're saying that the life of the departed one is irrelevant. If you can't mourn on Tisha B'Av, that means that you think, 
that you're our own. Your mind is irrelevant because our minds are corrupted. You think that our hearts, our souls, our bodies are irrelevant. There should be, there should be mourning. And there should be a strong desire for tikkun. So if you have questions, the time is now. Going once, going twice, going into Tisha B'Av with the hope that it'll be a time of redemption and return to ourselves and rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash. The Beis HaMikdash will be built physically by humans, but the Kedush will come down from Hashem and heal us and heal Am Yisro and heal the world. Amen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, hang on, we've got a question. We've got a question. Okay, a live one, yes. <laughs> um, how come we just kind of go back to normal, normally the next day after Shabbat? He's got not this year, but <laughs> like, why is the 10th of Av like a normal day? A normal day. It's very tricky. I mean, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Lachas are that in a general sense, the 10th of, of, of is sort of a half normal day. You're not supposed to really begin with eating meat and washing clothing until half the day. But this year, because it's Arab Shabbat, it really is a normal day. So the idea is as follows. You're supposed to take everything that Tisha B'Av is and bring it into real life. You have to take all of these lessons and bring them into real life. Okay. Okay. It's also Ja'an's birthday. On day. I can't wait to teach above. Why? Because vacation's the next day. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Rebbitson Gottlieb, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.